present plays from the four corners of the world. Comedy, drama, suspense, true life adventure in Tuesday Theatre. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. It was a mineral earth, a core of nickel iron encased in a mantle of dense rock, its surface more hostile to life than the face of the moon. An earth cocooned in clouds of its own making, of steam, smoke, and noxious gas that blotted out the sun. Ages passed. The cooling rains helped to break up the crust of this earth, filling the sunken plains and valleys with water to form the seas and oceans. The clouds thinned. The sun filtered through them, and there was light. Long ages passed, and there was life. Spawned in the warm oceans, life spread to the land, where tiny plants took root, forerunners of the green tide that was to creep over the earth, making it possible for man and beast to breathe and eat. Without plants, our world would die, and every living creature with it. But only now are the pioneers, men like Professor Reed, whom you are about to meet, beginning to recognize plants for what they are. Sentient creatures able to communicate and eager to cooperate with man in his desperate need to save this polluted earth. at the gate. Craftsmanship is mastership. The creative art of the old masters finds its counterpart in the exacting skill devoted to the making of Rembrandt van Rijn. The masterpiece in cigarettes. Firestone has an endless steel belt that takes the radial principle to its ultimate efficiency, always laying the tread firmly on the road, even while accelerating, braking and cornering. Firestone. Firestone steel belt radials, the most efficient tires. Firestone, it's the endless steel belt that makes the difference. Firestone. An industrialist's winter nightmare. Please, engine, start. I'm sorry you spent the cold night without Castrol antifreeze. Save starting time, prevent costly damage. Use Castrol antifreeze so your engines sleep warm. Very kind of you to meet me at the station, Professor. Not at all, Fleur. After all, you're the daughter of my old colleague, Dr. Fielding. I just hope you enjoy the job, that's all. Working with the eminent Professor Reed, whose experiments with plants have already startled the scientific world. How can I fail to enjoy it? <laughs> I can't wait to start. Oh, you might find it a little lonely out here. That's what I'm afraid of. Even a little spooky. Spooky? Well, it's an old farmhouse, you know, miles from anywhere. You'll see it as we come round this bay. Those blinding white gables. Cape Dutch. Mm. Centuries old and, as winter comes, inclined to be somewhat damp. If that's all I have to put out Oh, it with. won't be. For one thing, there'll be highly irregular hours. You have the basic training I need. But the time has come for all of us to go beyond those disciplines. The ancient Greeks believed that plants had souls, that nymphs dwelt in trees. Thank you, Professor. What do you believe? Just you wait one moment and I'll give you a little demonstration. Stay there. I'll get out and open it. There's no need to. I'll ask my friend to open it. I 
can't see any friends. So it must be some form of radio control or the interrupted beam of a photoelectric cell. Yes, it could be either, I grant you. But no, it's a friend. A friend percipient enough to read my thoughts. His name is Sirius. Night-blooming Sirius. Um, the cactus by the gate, you mean? That's the one. Ever heard of a fellow called Sauvin? Mm, vaguely. Well, isn't he an American electronics engineer who worked with plants at some stage? Yes, place? that's the man. He once worked for aerospace, but he was fascinated by extrasensory perception. Mm. And he didn't see why plants should not share this so-called phenomenon with other living creatures. Did you hear of his experiments with the toy electric train and the philodendron? Oh, I don't remember the details. I mean, briefly, he wired the philodendron to a galvanometer. Then he found that when he gave himself a small electric shock, the philodendron winced in sympathy, causing the needle of the galvanometer to jump. And it was simple enough to get this needle to trip a switch that would put the electric train into reverse. And then he found that he didn't have to give himself an electric shock, it was enough to remember the pain of it. And again, the philodendron would wince throwing the train into reverse. <laughs> it was all on American TV. Oh, it's uncanny. What does it mean, Professor Reed? It means, my dear, that plants have an awareness that the ancients perhaps realized, but that modern man is only now beginning to rediscover. Mm. Plants are sensitive to color wavelengths, for instance, far beyond the range of the human eye, and to sounds inaudible to the human ear. They have an energy field that overlaps our own, and in this way, they're able to share our emotions. Ah, Francois, good morning to you. Good morning. Fleur, I want you to meet your new colleague, Francois de Toy, Fleur Fielding. Oh, hello. How do you do? Francois is the electronics genius around here. Of course. The cactus at the gate. I still can't get over it. Oh, I merely supplied the circuitry. It was Professor Reed who established the contact. The true contact, that is. Not just the electrodes. Oh, it's still far beyond my pass of understanding. I've been puzzling over it all night. No, you'll get used to it. You've just got to accept that plants are not just, well... Not just wood from the roots up. <laughs> I think I've got as far as accepting that. Now, you're a botanist, Fleur. You know how plants react to physical stimuli and obstacles. Now, who would have thought that there was enough strength in a mushroom to tilt up a slab of concrete? We must assume that plants have some kind of intelligence. And the mammoth task ahead of us here is to find some means of communicating mm. with it. Ah, good morning, Pauline. Good morning. Uh, meet Fleur Fielding, our new botanist. Fleur, Miss Lennox, our administrative officer. <laughs> it sounds very grand, Fleur, but I'm really just the bookkeeper, secretary. Oh, oh, yeah. Welcome to Moonshine Manor. That's what I call oh, it. Right. Come on, <laughs> the nonsense that goes on around oh. here. And it's catching, that's the trouble. <laughs> I find myself avoiding the weeds in the path in case they complain to the professor of ill treatment. <laughs> <laughs> now, Pauline, I'm not as fanatical as all that. Pass the marmalade, Francois. Oh. Ah, thanks. Anyway, it's nice to know there's someone around here with both feet on the ground, Polly. Oh, I'm not alone, thank heavens. There's our aptly named Adam. He sounds like a gardener. Which is exactly what he is. Although he's on the books as a horticulturist. The best <laughs> horticulturalist I know, even if he's never opened a book on the subject. Adam is a practical man who knows his onions and loves every other plant besides. Rather more than he loves human beings, I'd say, Professor. Oh, I grant you that. Adam is the grumpiest green thumb in the business. But I'm used to him, and I like him as he is, even though he practically blows his top every time I ask him to do anything. He sounds quite a character, Professor. I look forward to meeting him. It must be Mr. Jenkins. Adam to the professional staff, miss. Oh, I'm Fleur Fielding, Adam. Fielding? Did you say, miss? Not... Yes, Dr. Roy Fielding's daughter. Did you know him, Adam? Worked under him, I did, at the old Agricultural Institute. Must be 15, 20 years ago. Oh, nearer 20. I was three years old when... when it happened. Sad time for all of us, it was. I would have done anything for him, miss. A proper gentleman. Oh, I can only just remember him. It was a tremendous shock to my mother when he took his own life. She never really got over it, poor darling. Professor Reed was a friend of his, you might say. Of course, he was only a lecturer in those days, junior to your dad. I know. It was probably because of the old association that he took me on here. Oh, gave me quite a turn it did, seeing you, miss. Oh. You're very like him in some ways. Oh? Uh, 
Odd to have a fielding back in the team, as you might say. Makes me think something's bound to happen. Oh, oh it's you, Francois. Oh, you startled me. Oh, I didn't expect to find you out here, Flo. Oh, such a lovely night. I came to admire the cactus. Oh, so many of its flowers are out. And the moths are busy. I don't blame them. Those fragrant, creamy white bells. I see so little of you, Fleur. You've been here over two months. Oh, but, Francois, we meet every day at meals. Alone, I mean. Like this in the warm dark. Francois, we're colleagues. Fellow scientists. Uh, what difference does that make? We're man and woman. We belong to the same generation. We've many of the same interests. I have a job to do. Oh, so have I. That doesn't make me immune to falling in love with you. Oh, Francois. It's true, Fleur. You must be aware of it. But I've done nothing to encourage you, Francois. The work I'm doing leaves me little time for romance. It leaves you plenty of time for chatting with people like the professor, even old Adam. Do I have to explain? Can't you trust me? I hope so. Both Professor Reed and Adam were at the old agricultural college at the time of my father's suicide. Uh, I still don't understand. What are you trying to find out? Why he did such a thing. He had everything to live for. A beautiful wife, no debts to speak of. Qualifications that would have led to a brilliant career. Yet he had to go and shoot himself through the head. Could it have been murder? No. He left a note. A note of explanation. Just words of apology and farewell. Oh, Fleur, it all happened nearly 20 years ago. What's the point of reopening old wounds? What good will it do? Someone drove him to do it. I want to find out who that someone was. And if you find out, what will you do then? That, Francois, will be for me to decide. Now, distinguished smoking comes to mild cigarettes in king-size length. Dunhill Superior Mild, King Size. A mild, rewarding cigarette in the Dunhill tradition. Made with patience, care and infinite skill to bring mildness to the gentle art of smoking. Now in king size length, Dunhill Superior Mild. From the most distinguished tobacco house in the world. One of the world's great tastes is superbly matured brandy. And this is what you will enjoy in every glass of Viceroy Old Liqueur Brandy. Aged and mellowed to perfection for people with the time to enjoy it, savour it, linger over it. Viceroy, the brandy of matchless maturity. Viceroy. Every time you see them smile Regular brushing with McLean's helps reduce decay by getting teeth clean, while the fluoride in McLean's is proven to make them stronger. Oh, every time they smile, it shows, it shows you chose McLean's. Morning, sir, you're up early. It's the best time to take specimens before the sun dries them out. Yeah, true. I, uh, I hope I didn't upset you last night. I wasn't going to say anything. Please, don't say anything more, Francois. Let's forget it. We have to work together, remember? Does that mean there's no hope for me? Oh, oh what's Betsy barking at? Oh, what's she found? I better have a look. She might have come across a puff at her. Oh. Hey, stop it! Betsy! Betsy! Oh. It's the professor. He's dead. Someone's killed him with a spade. I had a ten o'clock appointment with Professor Reed, Captain Basson, <laughs> and that's what brought me here. Nasty shock for you, Mr. Pinfold, finding the professor dead. Not merely dead, Captain, but brutally murdered. And <clears throat> I trust you will lose no time in finding out who did it. That's what I'm trying to do, sir. 
You knew Professor Reed well, you say? For the last five years, yes, but only in my professional capacity as attorney to the Lindley Trust. <laughs> the Trust kept this place going. If I may say so, sir, you... Don't sound very approving. I don't mind telling you, Captain, that I was against the grant from the beginning. <laughs> it's 50,000 a year, you know, not exactly chicken feed, but Horace Lindley had a bee in his bonnet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't wish to be disrespectful in any way to my late client, <laughs> or to the professor, for that matter, but, uh, uh, well, uh, between the two of them, they had some very weird ideas about botany, about plants. From what I could make out, they believed that plants were capable of absorbing and transmitting information, though just how, I can't say. <laughs> Poppycock, if you ask me. Yes, certainly sounds like it, sir. Did they manage to run this place on 50,000 a year? No, 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 no. They had other smaller grants from other institutions, but the Lindley Trust provided the main income. Mm-hmm. And you kept an eye on the spending of it, I suppose. Oh, Professor Reed kept me informed, yes. <laughs> I always made a point of studying the annual audit. Come in, Miss Fielding. Sit down, please. I'm sorry to have to question you again, but... Well, I'd like some further information from you, if I may. Of course, Captain. The research post you occupy here was advertised, you said. You applied for it and Professor Reed gave you a two-year contract. That is correct. This type of research interests you? Very much. You had no ulterior motive in applying for the job here? Why do you ask? I'm asking the questions, Miss Fielding. Please answer yes or no. <sighs> yes, I did have an ulterior motive, as you put it, Captain Basson. My father committed suicide when I was very young, and all my life the mystery of it has haunted me. Hmm. And you thought you'd find the answer to that mystery here? Possibly, yes. My father and the professor were not only colleagues at one time, but close friends. For some reason they quarreled shortly before my father's death. I wanted to find out why. For what reason, Miss Fielding? To satisfy a daughter's natural curiosity, Captain. Isn't that reason enough? I wonder, a more compelling reason, I'd say, would be a desire for revenge. But this is ridiculous, Captain Basson. Whoever murdered Professor Reed was a cold-blooded killer. I'm not denying it, Mr. Dutoy. Whoever killed him struck him savagely on the head from behind with that spade. With the edge of it, intending to kill. A woman could have done it. Not a woman like Fleur Fielding. Why not? She more or less admitted that she came here to avenge her father's death. But there's no evidence to indicate that the professor had anything to do with it. She might have discovered some. And you yourself have told me that you found her almost at the scene of the crime. But uh, he couldn't have been lying there dead last night when I was talking to her. How do you know? Well, uh, if he was, I swear that Fleur knew nothing about it. She was far too... too gentle... Too composed. She might have been putting on an act, for all you know. You admitted that your unexpected appearance startled her. Well, naturally it did. She was sitting there in the dark. Why? Why, Mr. Dutoy? Admiring the night-blooming Sirius. That cactus at the gate. Oh, yes? You don't believe me. For heaven's sake, why suspect Fleur? What about Pinfold? What about him? Yeah. What about him? He could have done it. He always resented the fact that old Horace Lindley subsidized most of the work carried out here through a grant from the trust he set up before he died. Yeah, now I remember. In terms of the old man's will, the grant was to terminate on the professor's death. <sighs> We'd all be out of a job. The place will have to close down. And you suspect Pinfell? Well, a more likely suspect than Fleur Fielding, I can tell you. We're not so very far from Worcester, where Pinfold lives. He could have motored over last night. Can I interrupt you, Miss Lennox? Oh, of course, Captain Basson. Anything I can do to help. You were so busy. Oh, it's not important, really. Just some odd reports David asked me to type. David? M the professor, I mean. How long have you known him, Miss Lennox? Oh, years and years. Mm hmm. May I 
ask you a personal question. You've asked me so many personal questions already. Why stop now? Were you in love with him? Why do you ask? You've been crying. I ran his office for him, Captain Masson. A 40-year-old spinster, always merry and bright. That was me. It doesn't answer my question. David Reed was hardly aware of my existence, Captain. He lived for his work. Women didn't enter into it. But if you must know... Yes, I loved him. <laughs> David, David. I know this must be very painful for you, Miss Lennox, but I won't keep you long. Mr. Pinfold said something about a grant. 50,000 a year from the Lindley Trust. But it didn't go very far. <laughs> Poor David. He had no idea of finance. The equipment he bought, the money he spent, much of it in cash. I was always pestering him for receipts. <laughs> How are things going? Uh, I seem to be getting nowhere fast, Mr. De Toy. Uh, what did old Adam have to say? Very little. I had a feeling he was playing dumb. Yeah, he can't tell you what he doesn't know. I still think he's important, if only because he's the common denominator between Fielding's suicide and Professor Reed's murder. He was certainly in the vicinity on both occasions. Old Adam, in spite of his gruff manner, is one of the gentlest people I've ever met. I can't see him murdering anybody, especially the Professor. They were old friends. I still think he's involved somehow. Doubt it. There's no motive. The chances are that some drunken laborer the professor had sacked at some stage came back and smashed in his head with a spade as an act of revenge. Mm, that's a possibility, but a remote one. Suppose I could produce a witness. What do you mean? To the murder. A witness, you say? A cactus. The one at the gate. Professor Reed planted it, cherished it. It registered pleasure at his approach. That's how it was possible to wire it up so it opened the gate. It's my belief that it will register terror at the approach of his murderer. I don't know what you're talking about, Mr. De Toy. Uh, let me say this, Captain Basson, without going into the technicalities. I've learned enough here to know that plants have responses to outside stimuli, even to someone who evokes love or fear. And we have the means of deciphering them. <laughs> Rothman's Extra Length, Finest Filter, and the best tobacco money can buy give true king-size flavor. That's why, all over the world, Rothman's King Size is offered with pride, accepted with pleasure. Rothman's King Size really satisfies. <laughs> Hi, Pete. Come on over. Ah, thanks, Tom. Hey, I see you're on to Pilsner, too. Yes, I like to start on beer and stay with it. Pilsner's the answer. It's less filling and, man, it's full of flavor. Mmm, that's Hansa for you. Cheers. Hansa Pilsner is the perfect beer to have when you're having more than one. You get all the true beer satisfaction you want and an average of 24% less carbohydrates. Hansa, for Pilsner lightness, it's a world trend. <laughs> If you want a magazine that's full of fun and has something for every member of the family, this week and every week, you should get... Family Radio. Magazine. It's the only magazine that's a part of the scene of everyone in the family. Magazine. It's the only magazine that's a part of the scene of theory is correct. Yeah, if he's guilty, the plant will respond frantically. You will hear the oscillations. Yeah. 
<laughs> so much for your witness. Give it a chance. Who's this now? It's either Fleur or Pauline. I'm not sure. It's too dark. Whoever it is, she'll soon be within range of the cactus. And set herself on fire, too. It wasn't easy to get Adam to talk. Pauline Lennox was his sister's child, a very willful woman, even when young. Dr. Fielding met her through Adam. He was a very sensitive man, very much ashamed of himself, fearful for his career. He committed suicide when Pauline told him she was to bear his child. The child was carried, and David Reed, who had quarreled with his friend Fielding over his association with Pauline, eventually took pity on her and gave her a job. But why did she kill the professor, Captain Besson? I think Mr. Pinfold can answer that one, Miss Fielding. Well, briefly, Miss Fielding, to keep him quiet. And she did it on the eve of my visit, not knowing what I might find out. As far as I can tell, there's about 20,000 of trust funds missing, with Professor Reed dead and his death laid at the door of some <coughs> casual labourer. She could have got away with the money and pinned the blame onto the professor. Even so, I can't help feeling sorry for Pauline Lennox. She lived in a world of make-believe. I've been wondering, Francois. Suppose David Reed were knocking a little too closely at some forbidden door. Suppose mankind cannot yet be trusted with the kind of knowledge he was about to reveal. Then she might well prove to be merely an instrument of some guardian fate. <laughs> same time next week when we shall bring you another comedy, drama, or play of suspense in Tuesday Theatre.